joining us this afternoon um, for this webinar. My name is Kristen Schlater from the Center for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership at Rice University. We're pleased to offer this programming as a professional learning opportunity through the National Association of Corporate Directors, Texas Tri-Cities Chapter. This particular webinar includes the following partners, Dini Spheris, Greater Houston Grantmakers Forum, the Robert and Janice McNair Foundation, Rice University Center for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership, and United Way of Greater Houston. The webinar format this afternoon provides the opportunity for participants to provide feedback through the chat function and to ask additional questions through the Q&A function located in the menu bar of your device. Please note this webinar is being recorded and may be viewed by others at a later date. Take this into consideration when you're providing identifying details about yourself or your organization when asking questions. You should have received several handouts electronically prior to the program, which will be sent after the program as well. These are reference materials and can be used at your discretion. Any questions submitted through the Q&A function will be held until later in the webinar during the Q&A portion of, of the session. You're joining us today for a unique conversation from surviving to thriving, reimagining your nonprofit organization. The panelists today will offer experience from the perspective of board and nonprofit executive level leadership and share insights on lessons learned and challenges still to face nonprofit organizations and the community at large. I'm pleased to turn this program over to the moderator for our discussion this afternoon, Dr. Ronnie Haggerty from the United Way of Greater Houston. Thanks so much, Kristen. It is a pleasure to see everyone here this morning, and it is an honor to be in the company of such um, wise and expert uh, panel members. So I'm going to begin by introducing each of our panel members briefly. You should have received copies of their extensive biographies, and you will know um, exactly the, the level of expertise that we have with us this morning. Um, Anna, I'm going to introduce you first of all. Anna Catalino manages an active board portfolio serving as an independent director for both public corporations and nonprofit organizations. She's a certified board leadership fellow of the National Association of Corporate Directors and president of the NICD Tri-Cities chapter. In the nonprofit sector, Ms. Catalano is a member of the board of directors of Houston Grand Opera a co-founder and board member of the World Innovation Network and a former board director of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, her 30 years of corporate experience includes, uh, spans three continents and both operational and functional roles. Um, she's been recognized as on Fortune's ranking of the most powerful women in international business, uh, director and board's director to watch and Women Inc.'s most influential board directors. Anna, happy to have you with us this morning. Here, thanks. Um, Doug Froche has spent over 30 years in the energy industry and is founder and owner of Sallyport Investments. Um, Doug is former chairman, president, and chief executive officer of El Paso Corporation, which owned North America's largest natural gas pipeline system. And prior to its merger with Kinder Morgan, was one of the largest mergers in the energy industry. Um, Doug has been actively involved in civic and philanthropic endeavors for many years. Um, he co-founded and is on the board of Next Op Vets. Additionally, he founded Houstonians for Great Public Schools, a nonprofit that seeks to increase public understanding of the roles and responsibilities of school board members. Um, he has been on the board of Small Steps Nurturing Center and currently serves on KIPP Texas Houston Regional Board, Good Reason Houston, Rice University Board of Trustees and the Council of Overseers at the Jesse H. Jones Graduate School of Management at Rice University. And finally, Brian Green is president and CEO of the Houston Food Bank, the largest Feeding America Food Bank in the nation and 2015's Food Bank of the Year. Um, in the year 2020, just this past year that we've closed on, the Houston Food Bank provided access to 159 million nutritious meals through a network of 1,500 community partners. Um, in August of 2011, the food bank moved into its current home, a 308,000 square foot warehouse and office facility um, following a 55 million capital campaign. 
the new building is four times larger than its previous one and allows for vastly more distribution of food. But it was one of those undertakings that we will be curious to find out how he persuaded his board to undertake that adventure. Before moving to Houston, Brian was the executive director of the Second Harvest Food Bank of Greater New Orleans and academia for 12 years. Um, outside of his food bank role, he's been active in the Global Food Bank Network and is adjunct professor and serves as advisory committee member for the University of Houston's Downtown College of Humanities and the Social Science. So um, welcome, all of you. Thank you so much for making time to be with us this morning. Um, certainly a year ago when COVID began to show its ugly face, um, we reacted quickly. We thought, well, perhaps we'll have to do something different for a few weeks and then we'll get back to normal. Um, who would have guessed that a year from now we would be struggling with the challenges that the pandemic has created for all of us? Um, thus, the, the creation of today's seminar. And I think we probably should begin by asking um, Anna, when you Think of the concept of reimagining your nonprofit. Uh, what comes to mind? Well, this past year has certainly challenged everyone's ability to kind of reimagine. Um, I think that that the real key was that um, boards got together and, you know, first of all, had to make sure that, you know, we had enough cash to kind of keep things going. Um, but then it was a matter of how do we reach out to our constituencies and continue, continue to offer the services um, that we were able to do. And so I think in the nonprofit world, it was really different depending on what type of nonprofit um, you're involved with. Um, in, the, in the case of um, the Houston Grand Opera, obviously, um, I, I was on the board last year. I rolled off at the end of the year. Um, you know, it was a matter you couldn't do performances, so you had to go digital. Um, you know, one one group that that spent a lot of time involved with this seminar here is um, NACD. And, you know, in order to reach all of our members who were all directors on boards themselves, we pivoted very, very quickly to digital delivery of all of our content and work with our sponsors to do that. So it was a, it was an incredible year for innovation um, and people who are willing to roll up their shirt sleeves and, and really put in some time. Thanks, Anna. Doug, when um, you think about reimagining, what outside experts should a nonprofit um, be turning to? Um, well, it obviously depends on the size and scope of the nonprofit. Um, I, I, I have seen work in the past bringing in a third party to help a board go through a strategic planning process, for example, or um, in a period of transition or crisis, maybe offering an outside resource as a coach for a CEO who may, who may be new to the role and struggling to, to step up to that next level. The one thing I would say as a, maybe a cautionary tale, and obviously people use third parties all the time for fundraising. Uh, I think there's a, there is a risk with, with bringing in outside consultants that staff uh, and management sort of turn the issue over to them. Mm. And, and, and in fact, in, you know, in the corporate world, I think employees are pretty cynical about new initiatives and outside consultants. And so they, they actually want to just turn it over to them. And that way, when it fails, they can say, see, it was the consultant's right. fault. I think as, as a board, you need to be really aware of that and make sure that if you bring in an outside consultant or a team, they're embedded with your team. Mm -hmm. so that your team is able to capture the knowledge that happens and it doesn't just walk back out the door at the end of the assignment and make sure that there's shared accountability for the outcome. Otherwise, you just end up with, I think you end up with potentially a report that sits on a desk and collects dust and it's not an actionable plan. We've all seen those, that's for sure. Brian, did you even have a chance to think about reimagining as you realized what COVID meant to you and to your role with the food bank? Well, for us, this was a lot like a regular disaster. Um, it's like the hurricane that won't go away, but so many of the, the, the lessons that we have from previous disasters, um, it was just kind of, okay, this is what we're going to do. And then you just had all the other wrinkles that go with it. Um, so being able to take a dramatic turn and a, a big ramp up is, is something that we've done before. It's just managing the other issues that went along with this is kind of 
the way we saw it. I'm, I'm curious. It, I don't think we can have uh, corporate and nonprofit partners together in the same conversation without asking. Um, you've, you, Anna and Doug, have both served on corporate and nonprofit boards. We say all the time nonprofits are business uh, and we need to act in a business-like fashion. What are really the differences between these for-profit and, and nonprofit entities? Anna, do you want to take a stab at that and then we'll get Doug's point well, of view? Well, I, I think a lot of it depends on the, the business that you're in. I mean, um, the I, I serve on a number of public company boards and for for board, for companies that are involved with helping people um, go through a, whether a crisis like this, um, they were super busy. I, I, I'm on the board of a home warranty company that that had an incredibly busy um, year. Um, businesses that are primarily, you know, B2B type consulting businesses, it's different. Everyone kind of worked from home and it was just a matter of don't go into the office, work from home, call on your clients if you can. I think when you're in the nonprofit, so many nonprofit businesses are service oriented and um, provide services that communities need, um, you know, like Brian's. I think that, um, you know, it, it, is, it is very different in, in cases like that where um, communities are counting on you to be there for them. And so um, the expectations I think are very different, which means the board needs to really be gelled and, and together in times like this, um, because there's a lot of quick decisions that have to be made. Doug, do you wanna follow up on that? Yeah, I, well, I think it's very, very dangerous to walk into a nonprofit board from a corporate job and say, we're gonna run this like a business. I mean, every, uh, you know, if you're on a, a, a for-profit board or a public company board, basically you're adequately resourced with human talent and financial talent. And every nonprofit I've ever been involved with is overworked and under-resourced. So you just have to start with that. And then I think the, pe the, the people that are attracted to, to run and work in nonprofits are motivated by a different set of, of principles that that absolutely need to be honored or you, you lose the very soul of the nonprofit that you went there to be a part of anyway. And then I would say the last thing is, you know, in the corporate world, I mean, you measure everything, right? Every, there's, a, there's a key performance indicator for everything in it. And they, not always, but they tend to be concrete. And what's not so easy if you run, for example, an arts organization to determine uh, you know, where everything lives within a key performance indicator, or when you're dealing, for example, with ending homelessness, which is a very multifaceted, long dated, complex problem that you, no matter what you do, you can't get there quickly. And so I, I think you, as a, you, you can help with things like governance processes, uh, making sure that the organization is financially stable, all those kinds of things are applicable. But I think you have to be really careful before you try to turn a really valuable nonprofit into, a, in quote, a business. I want to follow up just a bit, Doug, on are there tools or approaches or concepts that corporations use when it comes to reimagining their work or generating new ideas and innovative thinking are things that, that as nonprofits that we might consider adopting? Um, well, you know, the scenario planning has been around in the corporate world for since I think Shell was the original scenario planning company back in the early 1980s. Um, and it's been that in and of itself has been sort of reimagined. But I think I do think that uh, it's really hard in the middle of a crisis. But but the best boards find time to think out over the horizon and, and kind of think about the, the big questions. So to go back to a prior example or, or to, to, to go with the world of education, right? To, to go from your direct mission to then spending time as a board thinking about how you make sure that every child in Houston gets the best possible education. That's a really, that's a bigger, longer term thing. And, and I find those can often benefit from being outside facilitated the discussions, but so that you get alignment between the board and management. Brian, I often hear the conversation that, um, well, Brian has a very corporate board. That's why he is so successful. Um, how do you get your board to support your entrepreneurial vision? Uh, you have truly transformed the food bank from 
um, the day when you arrived, which I remember quite clearly, was as the buses started rolling in from Louisiana. So um, I don't know that you've had a moment when there wasn't a significant challenge facing you. Um, how, how have you worked with your board to um, bring them along with you, if you will? Well, I, I do think that is one of the advantages that we've had is our board members uh, tend to be um, president and CEOs, and they're used to that idea of, look, we're, we're about the, 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 the what, <laughs> you know, what do we want you to accomplish and to get that, that board role and the staff work on the, on the how and the staff, you know, do what it takes and have the flexibility. That's helped us immensely. Also, when you think about resources like consulting, et cetera, it's not so much, do you have the board members who have all these areas of expertise? Can they get you these areas of expertise? Um, that's worth a lot more. I, you know, one of the things I find dangerous on a board is if you have one person who is like an expert in an area, well, okay, that's still one opinion in that area. Is, is that really the, the right opinion? And you don't want board members just deferring to one opinion. You want board members who really think like board members. And that's been very, very helpful for us. And it's also made it, I think, more useful for the board because they really are living in that governance world. And I, I think uh, you know, they tend to find that a lot more satisfying. Yeah, there's a, there's a con, I, I like the concept of NIFO, nose in, fingers out. <laughs> that's, that's a good one. That's, that, at times, that's difficult for board members to do, but it's a really valuable concept to keep in mind. But the other thing, Ron, I just want to play on something that D Doug was saying earlier about, you know, the, the, the pivot and the difficulty in the nonprofit sector. And this is something that uh, Professor Doug Schuler over in Rice, you know, he made this observation, just looking at how nonprofits adjust. And he said, the reality is that most nonprofits are only funded to do what they currently do. Sure. It really makes pivoting difficult. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, uh, you know, for us, um, we're not as dependent upon, well, it's this grant funding exactly this, you know, because we've got uh, general community support um, has made pivoting easier for us. And I think that might have something to, to, to do with that, and as well as just embracing the culture. Good points. Good points. Anna, how, how can you use your corporate um, influence, if you will, and experience to reimagine a nonprofit or to push them in some different directions? Well, I think that I think Brian brings up a real good point, and that is um, when directors can bring and, prov and, and provide access to resources that are available in the corporate world to nonprofit um, a nonprofit organization, it's extremely helpful. So if you go through a strategic overview of what, what your organization is doing and you discover that there's not a lot of research in, in, the, in the archives about your constituents, um, you know, can you bring in an organization that does consumer research, market research, things like that, at either a pro bono or low bono rate that can help a nonprofit understand the community they're working in and how better to serve it. Those are, those are um, things that I think nonprofit board directors can really help with a lot of value. I think, you know, other, other things like access to technology has been something that's been real important during this crisis that a lot of corporations kind of take for granted. They all have big IT departments and they have people that, that understand how this works. A lot of nonprofits have struggled with that. And I think that there are a lot of directors that have been able to help their nonprofit organizations create kind of a more of a virtual communication um, system with their, with their, um, with their directors and with, with employees that maybe they didn't have access to in the past. Doug, I love your NIFO concept. I suspect that you have a very large audience which has just adapted it permanently. But I want to ask you, what do you do in a situation as a board member when um, the board has one vision, wants to go in a particular direction, and the CEO and staff are holding back or really want to go in a different way? How, when should you push and when should you not? Well, first of all, that's an untenable situation, right? You, 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 you cannot sustain the organization that way. And so you've got to come to a, a agreement. Um, I think, you know, having a board offsite, um, maybe even a facilitated board offsite that, that, that includes senior management for a portion and then excludes senior management for a portion. And then at the end of that process, if you feel like you've gotten alignment, 
I think it's always valuable to, for management to say back to the board, this is what we think we heard you say. This is what we're walking away with as an understanding. Is that the case? Because we often hear what we want to hear in conversations, just like in performance reviews, you know, we hear what all the great things that somebody says about us, we forget about all the criticisms. And so I, I think that's important, but in the end, I mean, I, I've always, I've always said whether it's a corporate board or a nonprofit board, I mean, a, a public company board or a nonprofit board, the board really has three things to do right. And if they do those three things, right, everything else works out. They help set the tone at the top. They hire and fire the CEO and they help set and approve strategy. If you get those three things right, you can get a lot else wrong, but you can't, the board can't exist. And in that case, I think if you ultimately can't get alignment, then I think the board has a job to do, which is to go find a new CEO. Brian, you kind of reacted to that question about the, the push pull. What, what are you thinking? No, just that, I'm not quite sure. I've not just seen studies like, you know, how often are CEOs fired where that ah, was a bad idea? And it was a good idea. Mostly what I've seen is, if anything, boards being too reluctant um, and a CEO who's just not performing that well um, and they just live with it. And I remember uh, I was pulled in actually by a former student when she, when she noticed that the, the organization she joined as a junior board member on was not performing the way we talked about in class. And so she pulled me in. And eventually I asked the board executive committee, well, if this was your private company and the CEO was performing like this, what would you do? And there was just, we'd fire. What is the difference? I mean, yes, you know, it's trickier because you've got the mission bottom line and the financial bottom line, and, and, and you've got to make sure you truly understand that. But the, the, the results are the same. Absolutely. So Anna, what, uh, thinking about boards, obviously I, I don't think we can avoid that question for very long. Um, what advice can you share when it comes to board recruitment? You know, Brian talked about his board and it, it is recognized as a, as a very strong um, influential board. Um, but if you, the vast majority of nonprofits are small nonprofits. Um, where do you begin to build that kind of board that, that's the dream board? Well, I think the, the the most important thing you you have to you have to think about and, and a good place to start is what are you trying to accomplish? What is the strategy? What is the mission of the organization? Therefore, what are the voices around the table that you think you need to have? Um, you know, and and it could be experience based. It could be community based. Um, it and depending on the nonprofit, there are some nonprofits that need to have sponsor voices in the room, donor voices in the room. Um, but but I think it's got to be strategically driven. It has to, you, you want to have people around the table who can help you think through the challenges that face your organization and have the experiences that, that can bring that to the table. I think that's the most important. Um, there are a lot of boards that, that are filled with donors, and, and I, I get that. I understand that model. Um, I, I think that you need to be careful that you don't have only donors who um, all they do is donate and they're they're not active board members because I think there's other structures you can create to keep those folks engaged. But a, a board should be a working board and a board that truly is willing to is willing to step up and and step into you know some some tough calls that have to be made from time to time and to help the 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 CEO and their team figure out. Um, you know, what to do. And, and this year, it was a real great example. I'm sure this was a year where people realized whether or not they had good boards of directors in the nonprofit world. That's a really good Doug, point. Doug, I want to follow up on that question just a little bit. And what can a, an organization, a, a CEO, realistically expect of board members? I, and I hear that, that sort of dichotomy all the time between a working, a working board and a governing board. Um, the governing board I often interpret as meaning they kind of support us financially and leave us alone. And um, the working board means you roll up your sleeves and you're down there in the trenches doing the work. Um, uh, what, what are your thoughts about uh, what is realistic? What, what can I ask my board to do? Well, for, first of all, I, I just think it's, it's a huge mistake. If you're a CEO of a nonprofit or if you're the executive director and you don't view yourself as the chief recruiting officer, 
mm -hmm. for board members. And if you're not, every time you have an engagement with someone socially that you find interesting, potentially valuable, smart, if you're not grabbing their card, <laughs> now you don't get to make the ch final choice because most nonprofits have a governance committee. They make the choice, but you got to realize this is a, these are nonprofit boards of people that are getting together half a dozen times a year. They're not walking away, spending their whole life thinking about board recruitment. I think that's the job of the, that's one of the jobs of a CEO. And the other thing is good executive directors drive the process for the board. They, do, they say, Hey, we need a skills matrix to determine what skill sets we have, where our gaps are, what our succession planning is going to be and how we manage that. And then drive the board to expand their mind share about who people are in the community that would be good board members. Cause if you don't, you know, the dirty little secret is you end up with a, a board that looks like me. That's not diverse. That's, that's, that's that doesn't have a, a, an adequate breadth of skill sets. And I think the good news is, is that I think more boards now are, are, are aware of that. And, and as part of the recruitment of a board member, if you have a set of cultures and expectations that you actually put down on paper, then you have less of a chance of recruiting a board member who gets on the board and only wants to write a check and never wants to do any work. And by the way, doing work doesn't mean management's work. <laughs> the work there is work in a board that is governance related work. And, and it takes time to review bylaws and make sure your committees are all structured properly and think about succession planning and all those kinds of things. That's work that's just not necessarily staff work. Brian, how do you navigate the board recruitment process? Thank you. Because uh, um, I think Doug hit it. Um, board members are good at re recruiting board members like them. And there's an interesting phenomenon in the U.S. that uh, just as in the corporate world, the bigger the budget of the nonprofit, the whiter and more male the boards are on average. But huh. so by the time the big ones are, mm -hmm. they're just like overwhelmingly white, um, which is wrong. Why? Well, again, that that phenomenon, and you know, you're competing, you're trying to get the, the CEOs and the presidents, and that tends to be a much more white and male space. Um, so, as an organization, you you better be targeted. You better be working on that because if you don't, you're going to end up with a board like that. Um, so, yeah, you you absolutely have to to work to do that. And I and I do think that the organization itself has inherent advantages in doing that. Because there are people that, that engage with us um, that are not engaging with our board members. And so you, they're also showing the interest and they're going to put in the work. And I do agree with Anna absolutely that the reality is once you think about that whole do, dual bottom line, you know, it's not, you're not just managing the finances. That's not that hard, frankly. It's the, what, how does the mission fit with what your opportunities are and what should you really be expecting from the organization? That is a lot of work. And that's where I think the board should be spending most of their energy um, because that's the really, that's the tough spot. And that's the part, the part that should not be owned by the staff because the staff doesn't rep the, represent the community the board does. Interesting perspective. Uh, Doug, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit here. Um, so you've been involved with one of the, the major mergers in the energy industry. Um, what would cause you as the member of a nonprofit board to look at the organization and say, you know, we really ought to be thinking about a, a merger, an acquisition, a dissolution. Those are scary words. Yeah, it's just, it's always been striking to me that it's easier to go merge two arch competitor public companies than it is to, to think about putting two small nonprofits together. <laughs> there is a, there's just this personal sense of ownership that I, I, I find I mean, it, it's, it can, it's, it's a value to the nonprofit, but there's an unwillingness to consider the possibility that two organizations should be put together or that one organization might have had uh, an effective mission before, but no longer does. And they tend to drag on because, frankly, donors continue to give them money. <laughs> and that's why I, I think when you have these big, if you're working on something that's a, a big, multifaceted issue, like food insecurity, like homelessness, like public education reform. That's the value of having a, an organization 
somewhere that kind of control that, that has the vision piece for the, for the whole community. And the homelessness is the great, is to me, the best example when they, uh, when Mayor Parker decided that she wanted her legacy to be in, to end chronic homelessness, she, she put the resources together and then the coalition for the homeless kind of has that overarching vision. And, and then you pull the 250 social service organizations that each have a piece of it together, get a common vision. And, and then any, none of those organizations had a vision to end homelessness. How can you? How could search have a, a vision on its own, but collectively you can. So that collective impact model and that what that does is that drives donors to the best of breed uh, in social service organizations. And that's if, if the money dries up, then different decisions get made in nonprofits. If everybody's getting funded, then, then there's no, certainly management's not going to come and say, hey, I'd like to put these two organizations together and one of us is not, not going to have a job. That, those are difficult things to do in any context. Hey, Ronnie, I'd, I'd love to, to chime in here. I just, um, you mentioned in, in the intro that I uh, rolled off of the Alzheimer's Association right. where I served um, on the national board of directors um, for eight years. And before that, I was on the local chapter board. But during my tenure on the national board, we actually made a huge decision to um, consolidate all of these separate 501c3s across the U.S. into one single 501c3 nationally. Um, and it took years to do because it took um, a lot of time to go out to the chapter network and speak to, you know, the, I, I want to say, I, I don't remember the exact number of how many we had, but I think we had, you know, over 50, over 50 chapters around the country and get everyone to sign on. Um, we lost a few, um, but, but we ended up doing that about five years ago, we consolidated everything into one 501c3. And the, the advantage that it gave us to, to a lot of what Doug was talking about was the leverage and the, the, the share of voice, if you will, of being able to speak with one voice to ensure that for all of the victims and caregivers out there across the US, that when they called the Alzheimer's Association, they could count on certain things consistently. Um, I know you've worked with our local chapter here quite a bit, so you're very familiar with the work that we do. Um, Houston had one of the one of the top chapters in the, in the country, so um, you, you saw kind of the one of the best of the best. Um, there were quite a few places in the U.S. where people weren't being served as well as as they were here in Houston, and and that needed to be corrected. And so I think um, those decisions of merging, consolidating. Are, they are huge decisions in the nonprofit world. It takes a lot of courage to do that. It takes a board and an executive team that are willing to spend a lot of time talking to a lot of people about the advantage. But um, I think it's certainly it's certainly worth worth doing because when you when you if you if you realize that there's an advantage to the scale, it's worth the work that it takes to to put into it. That was quite an undertaking. Brian, I know you've been involved in a, in a merger as well. Was it a merger, an acquisition? Sometimes we use euphemisms to make people a little more comfortable. How did you bring the boards along? Well, actually, the two organizations had, had tried to merge, I think, three or four times prior to this. And it always broke, and it always broke at the board level. And it goes back to exactly what <laughs> and I were saying. God, it's, it's just people own it, and they don't want to lose it. And, and and the reality is nobody drives away with a truckload of money when you, you know, when you merge two nonprofits. So overcoming the pain becomes hard for people to get, you know, be able to do. Um, yes, it was one of the organizations. Uh, the other uh, in hunger was kind of more under the gun. Um, but, you know, it's so much happened. Just a couple of people had so much influence. It was one board member on the in hunger board, uh, Mike, Mike Julian, who works for Drayton McLean. And, uh, you know, at this point very early on, he said, let's face it. This is this is not a merger. This is an acquisition. And I'm good with it. <laughs> and he's like, it was the wow. and I'm good with that because it was like, what's the purpose? I mean, do we have to really reconcile all the personnel policies and all the things versus just you know what, just fold it in or come on? This is about the community, not us. And it made all the difference in the world. And then at the staff level, Amy Reagan, who was the executive director, I mean, she was willing to put her ego aside and say, you know what, this is we're all going to be better off if we do this. And my board chair said, you know what, we got to make sure that we take care of them so that we're not, you know, throwing somebody out to the wind. But, you know, I, I guess you could say like maybe three people is really all it took, you know, to, you know, just to, to kind of do that leadership to make it possible. 
I, I, Brian brings up a real good point. I think it, it it's a key. It's a matter of whether you can keep the the mission of the organization in focus, or whether people have personal missions that are associated with being involved in an organization, right? So, you know, to galvanize the people, what what you're saying, what I'm hearing you say is there were a few voices that basically said, look, this is what we are actually all about, right? And that's why it makes sense. And I think that's that's the thing that's really hard in nonprofit because people get so personally connected to causes that they 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 really want to take ownership of it. And it's a wonderful thing to have. But if those pers- if that personal mission gets in the way of the organizational mission, you you'll sub-optimize. Doug, yep. you're shaking your head. I know one of the things that happens with um, mergers, acquisitions, um, combinations, that the cultures tend to be more of an issue than the financials and the the staffing and the policies and procedures. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, there's. I don't think there's any such thing as a merger of equals, and that's you know, it's somebody has to own the end result. You, 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 it's really difficult to merge two cultures, and and I would just say also that I, I, I personally haven't seen two nonprofits merge where one of them wasn't in the process of going broke. That is, that, my experience. That has been the primary motivation for a nonprofit to make a different decision about their future is when they become unresourced. And when that happens, then you get to exactly what Brian said, which is this is, it's just an acquisition and the Houston food bank culture is the one that survived. Right. Um, my guess is in the, Al- in the case of the Alzheimer's uh, entities that you're talking about, it was the leading entities it was their culture that ultimately survived when you put them all together. And that's, that's been my experience. And when, when you try to do this, well, we need to make sure we have one person from this organization and one person, you no, know, you pick the best of breed and you decide really quickly whether you're going to modify the culture of the surviving organization, or you're just going to and, and get on with it. Brian, how did you manage through that um, aspect of your merger? You know, I, I, first off, I immediately read two books, you know, when the whole is going, it's like, you know, how hard it's going to be. And other than, you know, communicate like crazy, um, it just wasn't that a challenge because of the leadership that was shown by, particularly by a couple of people from the end hunger side, made it amazingly easy, frankly. So it really wasn't that hard to manage, but I'm so glad I read the books and I actually borrowed one of them from the United Way. <laughs> glad to hear that. Glad to hear that. Um, so just offer one other acronym, I think, for change, because it, 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 yeah, I think it's true. Anytime you have big change, you have the five F's. You have family, friends, fence sitters, fighters, and foes. That's how people sort themselves. I like that. And you it's need good. to identify up front who the family members are, because they're your ambassadors to convince the fence sitters to become friends. <laughs> And you also have to identify who the foes are. A foe is not just someone that disagrees with the change. A foe is someone who wants to exist in your organization and actively foment dissent from that change. And you have to find out who those people are and make sure that they know that they're not going to be able to outlast the change. And if they continue to be foes, they, they're going to have to self-select to go do something else. And if you, if you do that, then I think you have a better chance of whatever change you're trying to implement actually being sustained. That's good advice. Um, I think that we have a new acronym to add to our uh, collection, our toolkit for today. You can't, um, we can't the corporate world without a bunch of acronyms. I'm, I'm looking forward to adding uh, a few more. Um, So I want to talk a little bit about funding Um, beyond stimulus or similar funds. And so the stimulus funds were a big issue for many nonprofits. Some of the larger ones with banking relationships were able to move pretty quickly. Many of the smaller or mid-sized ones weren't as successful. There's another round uh, looming. But in terms of uh, diversifying funding, that's a topic that has become more and more prominent. Um, what, What avenues would you recommend that our nonprofit sector be pursuing. Anna, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, I think one of the most important things that nonprofits need to need to really understand is um, whether or not in your community, the philanthropic 
um, profile is going to be changing um, going forward. There's a lot of a lot of cities where demographics are changing, and if you take a look at how philanthropy has happened um, in the past, and then you look forward another 30 years or 50 years, you know how different will that be? I think one of the areas that um, nonprofits really need to tap better is um, digital. Um, philanthropy and opportunity to, you know, crowdsource, crowdfund, things like that. Um, you know, uh, there are so many, so many um, fields that have really tapped that well. If you if you look at if you look at politics, for example, um, just think about how much um, fundraising has changed um, in that area. Um, all of the different causes that that um, spring up whenever there's a crisis that occurs, people send uh, set up all kinds of GoFundMe type type things, and and people are much less, you know, they used to be pretty reluctant to do things like that. And now people don't think twice about, about um, things like that. So I think keeping an eye on how um, things might be changing is, is something I think that's really important. And technology is an area that I think nonprofits often are a little bit behind on. And I think it behooves nonprofit or, um, industry to, to really be up on that. Doug, legally, the board is financially responsible for the well-being of the organization. What kind of specific steps might board members be taking to reinforce revenue generation? Well, I think I think one of the th places that a board can be helpful is if you if you accept my premise that nonprofits are uh, overworked and under resourced. There's a temptation in nonprofits to chase the next grant. Right. So the grant comes up and you say, you say to yourself, well, that's not exactly what we do, but it's kind of close and we're under resourced. So we're going to go do that. This is management. And you, and you do that over a decade and you end up with, you know, the house that's been where they've added a room on every three years and you end up with a, a, an incoherent um, organization. I've, I've witnessed this personally so I think as a board, you can you, you that's where you can add value by saying, well, wait a minute. We don't even provide direct services in this issue. Why are we chasing a grant where half the grant depends on providing direct services, which we don't even know how to do? But the flip side is also you to to Brian's point earlier, if if the board has made it with management a, a strategic decision to to grow or to move to move into a new area then that's the time the board's got to step up and help management with the money raising piece. Cause I, I have, there are some executive directors that I've seen that are just fantastic money raisers, but I've more often seen that they really rely on some members of the board to help them think strategically about how to put a capital plan together. Brian, how much influence do you think funders should have on your business? Um, I wish the good ones had a lot more influence. <laughs> So, I mean, I, I look at the, you know, how, how philanthropy is changing in the U.S. And frankly, it, it's, it scares me. Um, non evaluating nonprofit and good investments is much more difficult than business good investments. You know, there's no Dun and Bradstreet. You can't just look at these rates of return in the newspaper or anything like, you know. And, you know, the, even when, when donors try to do that, like they go to something like Charity Navigator. And, oh, look at this Charity Navigator score. Well, it's a financial rating plus transparency. It means nothing about your output, nothing about your impact, nothing you know about how much you actually make and change in, in society. And so you can look really good without being any good. And so the more and more that people are kind of doing this, oh, crowdsource and stuff, that's great in one way, but are they really understanding the organizations they're giving to? And that was always the advantage of like United Way. You know, United Way doesn't like to be called a mutual fund, but I always looked at United Way as like a mutual fund. You know, hey, that's good. And we're not a United Way agency, but I, I like what they do because people can, oh, let these people figure this out. Or the, the big foundations and stuff is, so it's kind of like the, all these smaller non-consistent things happen. You know, it doesn't encourage nonprofits to be more strategic and always be doing right. It's like, you know, how to be the flash in the pan. And I don't see that as good, uh, you know, good for having max, maximum impact. Um, so, you know, but those are the waters we have to navigate. What I most would like to see is especially the big players. Now, the big players are not most of the money anymore, right? 75% of the giving is individual um, foundations or what, like 15 corporates, like five. Um, but the more that the big players kind of get together, the more things like pushy mergers, 
um, between organizations without having to wait till one's about to go bankrupt uh, become feasible because it's not going to happen from the from the crowdsourcing people. Ronnie, if I can just add add another um, point, and that is that as you as you hear the dialogue increase in the for profit world about the importance of stakeholder interests and community impact, I I actually see more of a convergence um, in the future between what the for profit world is doing in communities for impact and what the non profit world is doing, and I see. I see a lot of opportunity for collaboration, um, which could potentially result in in funding as well in nonprofit world. I don't know how it's gonna shape up, but I know that corporations are terrible at delivering some of the the things that nonprofits do very well. Um, Corporations are bad at doing what a lot of nonprofits are good at doing and vice versa. And so it seems like there's almost going to be a natural collaboration between these two sectors and it'll be interesting to see how that shapes up. I think if corporations are smart, they will find ways to collaborate with very good nonprofit organizations going forward. You know, Brian commented about uh, his concern, uh, the changes that he's seeing in philanthropy. And a couple of years ago, uh, there was a headline in the Wall Street Journal that uh, said the end of philanthropy as we know it. And it was a comment on the Zuckerberg shift from traditional foundation funding to an LLC. And we've seen that locally here in Houston with the Arnold Foundation. They've also chosen to shift their approach to philanthropy. Doug, um, are we seeing, uh, should we be concerned? Are philanthropy going away? No, I I don't think we should be concerned about philanthropy going away. And and I think that this is sort of the, the next maturation process. I mean, if you think about the, the amount of wealth that's been created and people that are young, you know, it, it, it's not it's not Andrew Carnegie anymore. It's you know, if you just to take John and Laura Arnold, a lot of that happened before they were forty. Right. So there is there is wonderful potential in that because now you have uh, institutional money in the hands of people that are young enough that if they want to, they can take these long dated problems and fund them and fix them in their lifetime. I know that's part of John and Laura's Mm -hmm. vision, right? Is to be involved in in, um, an education reform at a national scale and and be young enough to to see the end product because it's gonna take three decades. So all that's great. I think that the the other side of that coin is that when you have uh, large endowments that are that are funded and the the person who created that wealth is still alive, it's very difficult for them to give a grant without strings attached. It's very difficult for them to give a grant without telling you what to do with it. I think it was what, one of the things that was really cool about um, uh, about Amazon's ex-wife. Um, Mackenzie uh, Scott. Mackenzie Scott. Yeah. I can tell you that the, the 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 HBCUs in particular that she gave funding to, they never get money where where the donor says use it as you see fit, <laughs> and that so so I think as we go through this process, like I think even the Zuck, Zuckerbergs view what they're doing now differently than they viewed it when they thought they could give a hundred million dollars to the state of New Jersey and fix public education, right? The gates, same same thing. It's a maturation process. So I don't think it's going away. I think it's we're just in a in a really interesting new era. Brian, thoughts on that? No, uh, I, I I agree that I mean the reality is uh, charitable giving is still about two percent of GDP, just as it's been for years and years and years. Most of it is just kind of you know going out to what's catching people's attention. I don't I don't see that changing uh, dramatically. Uh, I, you know, gosh, since I started in over 30 years ago, you know, I was being told about yeah, the, the great tra- generational transfer of wealth that's going to happen and how much that, that's going to impact. And for the most part, no, think, things are looking <laughs> fairly normal. Um, uh, I, I, I do think that the, that, the big, that the big players working together could have more impact because I still think that the, our number one issue in the, in the charitable sector is how to make how to get the money directed where it does the most good 
and it's the people being, you know, investing to, you know, the time to do that would have a huge impact. If you think of it, like if we had a community filled with David Weekly's, not just the generosity part, but how much effort he puts into understanding his investments and, 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 and targeting, I think we'd be a lot better off. So I, I just want to follow up a little bit with your um, moving and, and looking at this in a different, um, from a different lens. You've become um, very entrepreneurial. Uh, you've moved into hospitality, if you will, which of course seems a, lo- a logical offshoot from um, a food bank. But talk a little bit about what has led you to your conference center, your catering. Um, th- those are fee-for-service activities, right? Yeah, I mean, the reality of most uh, social enterprise, social entrepreneurship, the social enterprises, most of them are bad ideas. Um, right. the, good, the good ones have a tendency to kind of flow out of your work rather than try to be this, this add-on from the side. Like, oh, we're going to run a business without being experts in this business. I bet that will go well. No, it usually doesn't. Um, but it actually made sense for us because we were already so driven by volunteers, so so needing to get as many people working in this building as possible. And well, how do we combine that with making it a great experience? Because we want to be a destination. And so these things all kind of flowed from that, from having um, kind of a strategy that makes sense given your place in the community. And then you see, you know, how you can build on from it. Anna, I'm going to, we're looking, I'm watching our time here and I've got a couple of other questions that I don't want to lose be, before we um, wrap up, but we haven't talked about risk. So as you're thinking about change and innovation and reimagining, what are some risks or red flags that you're going to be keeping your eye out for? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that that um, organizations, whether they're for profit or nonprofit, really need to need to have their get their arms around is understanding how the world is changing and understanding demographic changes. And if you if you take a look at this country in particular, um, your risk of, of having a board that is out of touch with how a city is changing is, is huge, absolutely huge. And so I, I think that it's really important to understand um, how you're going to be an organization that can serve not only today's community, but the future community. And so I, I think that risk is bigger than ever before because of the shifts that are going on in this country. Um, having an out of touch board with things that are going on in the in the conversation is a real danger, I think. I, this is not a, a day and age where you can afford to be very tone deaf. Doug, that leads us a bit to questions about data. And, and you've, you and Anna have both referenced that a bit this morning. Um, what, what kind of data should you as a board be capturing? What uh, What are you looking for that will help with setting your KPIs to whatever extent that's possible? I think, I think, um, I think data is your best fundraising tool. And so if you're, I'll give you the, uh, an example that's fresh for me when we started Next Stop, which is a, a nonprofit that gets jobs for mostly post 9-11 uh, combat enlisted military uh, veterans. And we, we said, the one thing we're going to do from the day we start is collect data that's auditable. But because one, this is complete venture capital. We don't know if it's going to work, but if it does work, we're not ever going to have to worry about raising money. So now I can tell you that, you know, we get a job in 27 days at an average salary of $59,000 a year without a college degree. We have a four year retention rate of 74%. Um, and it costs us fifteen hundred dollars a job, which is about ten percent of a headhunter. All we have to do is give that speech, and anybody who's inclined to help veterans writes a check. And I think that's you can't do that in every aspect of every nonprofit, but I think if you think about it up front and you spend just a little bit of time thinking about architecture and how you collect it in the in the education space, you know it's great for you to walk in with an education nonprofit and give me a pitch about all the anecdotal great things that you do. But in the end, if you want to, if you really want to have a scalable nonprofit for education reform, you need to have some uh, double blind gold standard peer reviewed results. And that takes thought ahead of time. You don't just decide that you're going to do that and it's done in six months. 
Anna, you are definitely a, a data-driven person. Um, thoughts about data that we should be collecting as nonprofits? Well, I think I think collecting information about um, how well you're delivering what your mission is supposed to be delivering is really important. Um, you know, however you possibly can measure that is is important. Um, I think you know every nonprofit has a population of people they hope to reach, and they reach a fraction of that. Understanding the population that you hope to reach that you're not reaching and why you're not reaching them. I think is really important. Um, whether you are a group like NACD that tries to reach corporate directors that for some reason don't sign on, um, whether you are an opera company that isn't reaching people because they, they don't come to the opera or they don't come back a second time, or whether you're, you know, you're a, a healthcare organization that's trying to reach people that, that are associated with a terrible disease and they're not coming to you. Um, I think not not only reaching the people that you're serving and saying, how well are you doing, but reaching the people you're not serving and figuring out why not is really important. Very different perspective. Brian, I'm going to let you wrap up our conversation part here before we turn to some questions, and we've got lots of them. Um, some of your data gatherings, probably fairly easy. Um, number of meals, number of partners. What what other kind of data are you capturing? What What outcomes are you looking for these days? So we kind of look at it at two, two levels. I mean, there's, there's all the operational stuff because remember, no matter how much you, you define what's the best impact to do, it, you know, it still becomes outputs that you can measure on a very consistent basis. And so you think about your more outcome level stuff that you do more less frequently, but a staff level, you know, if you're trying to guide you know, actions, that needs to be just out, out, outputs and we're just metric up like crazy on that kind of stuff. Um, then you, it's more like the board level where you're saying, what are the board's goals? And then what are the measurements that are the best we can do? Not always perfect. There can be um, a little bit qualitative instead of quantitative in some cases. And then that, those the board sees every then quarter. Um, so we've got our dashboard that shows how we're progressing towards the goals. And I think the more that you're thinking your outcome type goals are oriented towards what are the goals that are stored, or measurements are oriented towards what are the measurements that, you're, that you've established. I will say, playing off of Anna's point on, uh, you know, looking at the population, that's the neat part. That's so much easier now than it was just a few years ago, because being able to get with the mapping software and the databases, uh, a much better understanding of the population we're serving and who we're missing and, and being able to look at it like, well, how, how, how are we doing in this neighborhood versus that neighborhood for the people we serve? It's, you know, it's, it's a real tool now. Well, and I think we here in Houston are particularly fortunate. We have um, Dr. Stephen Kleinberg's Houston Area Survey, his annual presentations coming up um, in May. Um, we have uh, another new, relatively new initiative, Understanding Houston, which has a, a great uh, website. Uh, again, measurement capabilities. Um, United Way of Greater Houston has our ALICE data. Uh, where you can actually figure out where the population lives and where what services are available. And same with our 211 data uh, from our helpline. That's real-time data, people calling every day asking for real things in real time. So um, we're very fortunate as a community to have some readily accessible data tools um, and then to tailor them to our own individual needs. Of course, they're, they're where the rubber really meets the road. So I, I want to thank all of you for your insights on our questions that we had prepared in advance, but we now have a number of questions from our audience. So we are going to shift to those questions. And the first one, Doug, is for you. And that is a request for you to repeat the five Fs. I think most of us got three out of five. But we probably wouldn't pass the test. Family, friends, fence sitters, fighters, and foes. I missed the fighters one, okay. I missed great. the fighters too, that's the one I missed. Okay. So next question, uh, Doug, your point about making staff owners of planning and change projects, um, any thoughts about how to add capacity to handle those planning and change projects while keeping them in full ownership, uh, given the fact that we're most of us running with a fairly lean staff? How do you um, equip staff with the sort of the knowledge and skills that they need to really get into planning? I think you have two choices. One is you, if, if you have a good working board and you have board members that have some domain expertise, you form an ad hoc committee that, that isn't meant to last long. 
and you 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 ask the, a small subgroup of the board to work with management. That's one path, and the other path, and that by the way, that's the one that doesn't cost you any money if you're resource constrained. The other path is to bring somebody in from from the outside. Uh, you know, you, Brian mentioned uh, David Weekly. You know, you, you go you go make your pitch to David around the green marble table, and, and <laughs> at some point, if you don't have a strategic plan, he's going to give you access to Kim Sterling and they're going to help you create a strategic plan, right? So right. something like that as a model. At this point in the, and I'm going to ask you this, I'm going to direct this to you. At this point in the recovery cycle, the pandemic, um, where are, where do you think nonprofits are in terms of their financial recovery? And then um, related to that, in terms of major strategic projects, where do you see CEOs needing the most help? Um, you know, at this point, at, at this point in the pandemic, I, I think everyone is starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, I know it's been a long tunnel, right? But I'm I'm having more conversations on the boards that I sit on, both for profit and nonprofit, talking more about what are we going to what are we going to do six months from now? What's the, what's it going to look like? What does post pandemic look like? And it's not just a rubber band that bounces back to where it was before. And so I'm seeing a lot of conversation around um, how do we take what we learned and actually enjoyed during this <laughs> time out that we had. And, and, and there have been silver linings, right, during, during the last year. What do we want to retain and keep? You know, were we able to reach people that we never before were able to reach because we use technology instead of in-person things? Um, and then what do we miss that we want to get back? And I think um, moving on to your second question, what do CEOs need help with? I think it's thinking through things like that and then figuring out what's it going to take to deliver that new future reality um, to the people that we intend to serve. I, I think that is um, the challenge and it's also the most exciting because you're getting a chance to kind of reinvent yourself and to say, this is now what we stand for. We, we've taken the lessons from, the, from 2020, and we have now moved into kind of a, a new world where we're actually able to do a little bit of, of both. Brian, I want to follow up with you a bit here. You, you made the shocking statement recently that you don't do traditional strategic planning. Um, <laughs> how are you approaching planning, I, I, just as a follow-up to sort of Anna's observations? Yeah, I'm still able to get it to uh, Mr. Weekly's green, green marble table. Uh, so we just learned years ago that just the rate at which these opportunities happen that the, and the magnitude of them uh, were larger than what we had planned. Uh, so we do strategic goal setting. I made this change. It was almost 15 years ago, uh, recognizing that our rate of change was just so fast to think that I'm plan actually planning out this is how we're going to be doing it in three years was just such nonsense. Um, and it's worked really well because we do the goal setting, we, we set the metrics with, you know, with the goals, and then we do the annual plans. And it's enabled us to be much more nimble, uh, which is really what we're shooting for. I recognize that it's so opportunistic, at least you know, our work, but I think the world in general is, is becoming more that way. And so you want to figure out who you are and what you're trying to accomplish. And then the means kind of have a set an idea of it, but then be willing to, to change very rapidly. Doug, you mentioned early in our conversation today um, the fact that scenario planning is something that corporations really um, depend on very heavily. Can you tell us a little bit more about scenario planning for those who are less familiar with it? Yeah, you know, well, first of all, I would say that that, that not every public company does scenario planning. It's it's a it's a it's a method that has sort of waxed and waned over the years. But I think generally speaking, you want to you want to think about a set of macro variables and, and a wide dispersion of outcomes on those macro variables, and then determine what your plan looks like under each of those scenarios. And I would say my, my experience has been we collectively dramatically underestimate the risk of downside. And so you end up, I think the worst scenario plans are the ones that all exist within a band like this, because none of those contemplate a pandemic plus a financial crisis plus an ice storm, right? And so if you're going to do the scenario planning, you need to widen the bands. And that's how you stretch people's 
thought process around how you might react. The time to determine as a nonprofit that you need nine months of liquidity in order to survive the downside is not two months into a pandemic. It's two years before the pandemic. Good point. Good point. Our next question is back to the topic of mergers. Um, so how does the nonprofit sector change its mindset and be less territorial about mergers? Anna, how can, how can they be more proactive? So you went through a, a year-long, several-year-long nationwide process of pulling organizations together. What, what wisdom can you share from that experience? I think the I think the argument in the narrative that probably carried the most weight is when we talked about what was what was the mission how many people were we not reaching in the Alzheimer's Association um, with the work that everyone was doing um, we were only reaching kind of five percent of the target audience of what we were shooting for honestly and this is a disease that was impacting more and more people so we knew that the structure wasn't going to allow us to be successful in the overall mission. So bringing the message back to the mission and saying, here's what we're missing and here's why changing the structure is going to help us fulfill that was the, was the, the, the most convincing argument I think we could have made because it, was, it became obvious to everyone that in no way was doing the same thing going to get us there. So we, had to, we actually had to change it. Brian, have you been called upon by your colleagues to talk about mergers? And um, it's interesting to me that very often the CEOs of the organization uh, recognize the opportunity and are pretty comfortable with it early on. It, it is really persuading the board, quite frankly, that that can be more challenging. Um, have, have you had an opportunity to lend your wisdom there? Yeah, uh, I'm a couple of times and uh, I usually fail. Um, I mean, <laughs> I do, I do absolutely agree with Anna. In the nonprofit sector, a very legitimate thing to say and a very powerful thing to say, I think, is this isn't about you. Right. Now, I think you know, not to put words in other people's mouth, but Doug, tell me if I'm wrong. But I think in the corporate sector, if you say this isn't about you, they're going to think, yeah, it is. <laughs> that's why I'm, that's why I'm doing this. I'm trying to, you know, advance my career, make make, make great things happen. In the nonprofit sector, we're supposed to be doing this for mission. And if you can confront the people about how. You know, you know, force them to get past their motivated reasoning that you know the, the, the people are better served with this. It's it's a very powerful argument. I would just I don't think they're that far apart. What you're saying is in the nonprofit. What I thought I heard you say in the nonprofit is about the mission and furthering the mission, and it and and in its purest form, a, a business combination among public companies is about ensuring the long term health and value for the shareholder. It actually shouldn't be about you. It should be about the the, the mission and the owners. Um, I'm not saying that it doesn't come, become about people, but by the way, the the biggest blocker in in corporate M&A are are what are called social issues, and the biggest block meaning, well, I'm not going to take that to my board because I won't get to be the CEO of the new company. That kind of thing. I think. My experience, at least, has been the biggest blocker in nonprofit mergers are boards, yeah. and and typically a small subset of the board who who are either founding board members or large donors. Good point. Good point. Uh, so our next question: How do nonprofits become more comfortable with with ranking themselves against a competitive set and making decisions from that frame? And I think this takes us back to your data. Um, you know, looking at the competitive environment, um, how, how do you begin that conversation? Well, you know, it's it's interesting because in, in the for-profit world, it's it's not that hard to identify who your competitors are, um, even if even if they're in different sectors. It's not that difficult to identify that. Um, in the in the nonprofit world, I think there is a degree of specialness that a lot of nonprofits want to have about themselves. And it's because it's, it's, it's individual organization mission driven. I think there are a lot of nonprofits that don't believe they compete with some of these other organizations. And, and I think what you need to, what you need to boil it down to is you, you compete at the end of the day, you compete for time and resources, right? You really do. And, and again, it goes back to data 
And it goes back to understanding if you want to be successful or grow, what are the things that, what are the right determining factors there for you? And therefore, what is it you really need to understand to say, this is what's keeping it from happening. And um, I think it's very important for nonprofits to, to understand who the competitor set is, not only for their, the services they provide, but frankly, for the talent that you recruit. You know, who else is getting the good people um, that, are, that are dedicated to the, the idea that you are trying to, the, the problem you're trying to solve? Um, and so I think you've got, you've got to stop thinking of yourself in such a precious way that you say, there's nobody who's in this space like we are, therefore we're not going to compare ourselves to anyone else. Doug, you're in the education space. It seems as if there are probably a growing number of competitors in that space. How are you tracking that? You know, I, so I was just thinking of, to me, the perfect example of the way it ought to work is KISS, KIPP, and Yes Prep. And they have what they call co-opetition. Uh -huh. They absolutely are trying to outperform one another. I mean, I, I have some of my best friends on the on the Yes Prep board, and we, you know, but but Kip uh, takes advantage of Yes Prep's teacher training program because they're really good at it, teacher le teacher and leader training. And Yes Prep takes advantage of Kip's Kip to College program because they've gotten really good at it because they both realize, yeah, we. Um, competing against each other makes us both better, which furthers the mission of both organizations. And what's the harm, yeah. right? At the end of the day, what's the harm? That's the most healthy, you know, which is a complete different animal when you're comparing a traditional ISD against a charter, right? where that's just kind of brutal competition, which I, I, I don't think that is as, a, as successful an outcome for either entity. Doug, I, I think you're absolutely right. And coopetition is a word that NACD uses as well. And I think that one of the important things, Ronnie, to recognize is most nonprofit organizations work in a part of a value chain of a very long chain. Whether you're in education or whether you're in food, whether you're in health, you're not the whole soup to nuts. You're, you're part of it, right? And finding somebody else in the other part of the value chain, actually, that you can cooperate with and yeah, you you might be in competition, but working together, there's some there's some synergies and some symbiotic relationship. NACD, as as you're probably aware, just started a um, a few years ago, um, embarked on a certification process for directors, so the directors can become certified. One thing that we recognized is there are a lot of universities out there that have preparedness courses that people can go through to be ready to be certified. And we've realized there's a real opportunity to dovetail these efforts together, both nonprofit, but both in different sections of this value chain that when you work together, we can create for people coming out of a university program that says we're ready to become directors to say, ah, why don't we append a certification onto that and make that even stronger? It's a real great opportunity. It's, an, it's a great example of two nonprofits that say, hey, we can, we can work together and, and both increase the value that we bring. That makes sense. Brian, there are those who would probably say you have no competition um, given the, the size of uh, your organization. On the other hand, I find it very interesting that you describe your 1,500 partners as opposed to clients or customers, or um, how do you view competition? Well, actually, I think when you think about nonprofits, because nonprofits compete for attention, which I think overwhelmingly has little to do with performance. So, <laughs> you know, true. when we think of the competition, it doesn't work like that way for us for the, for the most part. It's really more about coming up with the best measurements. And that's where it doesn't really matter if the other organization is in your city. So we really have you think about for a food bank is, well, what about the other food banks? You know, what's, what's San Antonio doing? What's Dallas doing? You know, that's where we really should be focused, I think, as a food bank. Um, and then just interestingly, uh, in the last contract, so the food banks have with the Feeding America, you know, a, a contract, an agreement that we all, you know, go to. And it was something I was co-chair of that, that, that task force. And one of the things I pushed hard and finally won, a slightly dumbed down version, was you had to not only have the set of metrics that Feeding America collects on, you know, some performance metrics, you have to annually share that with your board of directors. 
Um, and it was the first time. And it was a real struggle because it started off, the vast majority of food banks, said, I don't want to do that. It's like, how can you justify not doing that? You know, why is that right? It was, well, because I'm not perfect. Doesn't matter. None of those comparisons are perfect anyway. This is information for them to take. But, you know, again, as Anna said, you hit them with the mission. And they say, oh, you're right. We're going to do this. And so you finally make that change. But it's actually finding what are the comps for your organization? Because no matter what, surely there's other organizations in the country. What are they measuring? And this is where I, again, think that the major donors can be very helpful. Because the more the major donors ask people, ask organizations for that. It's like, who are comparable organizations to you? You say, well, there's nobody else in my city. Okay, fine. What about other cities? Surely you're not alone in the other city. You mean you've not researched that? You've not asked them? That, don't give money. Good point. That the we're not on an island anymore. That the communication makes it possible to to be everywhere and and keep up far more broadly than we could in the past. So we're back. A PS to that is that something you can do in a session? Um, thoughts on strategic planning, Anna? Yeah, I mean, um, we we go through. I mean, at, at the NACD group, we we went through a um, strategic planning session in in August. We we try and do it every year. Um, interestingly, this year we we took a different timeline and said, you know what, we need to talk about kind of COVID timelines. So let's change this up a little bit. And we we get our board as well as our advisory board together and. Um, We've, we've got an advisory board that is made up of um, three, three kinds of people, people who were getting to know, people who have rolled off the main board and are moving on to advisory. And then we've got sponsors also in that group, all very important voices um, that we want to continue to hear from. And we, we get people together and we did bring in a third party. Um, we do every year. And this year we, we um, used a new third party, which was fantastic. And we, we start out with data. You got to start out with a lot of data that says, here's what people think of, of what we've done. Here's the, here's the group that we're not appealing to and, and why not. And then um, take time to listen to people's voices and create a, a, a methodology to kind of capture all those. And out of that, you know, I think the other thing that's important is to have a board governance system that gives you an answer to, okay, what do we do with this? Right? Because out of every strategic conversation comes a list of things that you want to do. And the nice thing about our group is we've got three working committees that it's easy to slot these activities into. And so we, we gather information, work it as a group, and then we are able to slot it back into the committee system, which I think is really helpful. So Doug, how much time should we be allocating to this process? Um, you both mentioned the possibility of um, bringing in a, in a third party. How do you keep the plan top of mind with board members? Um, I, I think, first of all, you know, to have a really good strategic planning meeting actually requires a, a lot of work ahead of the meeting. And, and I think you have to think about your annual calendar and when you have that report relative to when you're starting a new year is important if you're going to do it annually, and then you sort of back up from that. Now, we've I've, One that's been successful is where you, you come in for a half day, and in the first half of the day, you bring in some outside resources. Might not be a facilitator. It might be somebody that has domain expertise in an area of risk for the organization or an area of an op opportunity, sort of so expand the board's mind and management's a bit. And then the, the next half, the, the rest of that day, kind of management presents its views on a, the strategic plan and then have a dinner where it's more relaxed and, and you can have open-ended conversations that don't require a conclusion. And then after the dinner, management goes away and synthesizes what they think they heard from the day. And the next, the next morning, management plays back what they think they heard and what they think where they think they need to be headed uh, for the next year in a strategic plan. That's not, that's just one example, but I, I think the more important thing is to be intentional about planning a calendar 
-hmm. and planning and giving the board enough information ahead of time that you don't spend all day reading PowerPoint slides, you know, put up a PowerPoint <laughs> slide and then read it to the board. That's not really a very effective means of strategic planning. Brian, a uh, question for you. What was the biggest challenge you and your board faced communicating through just barely off of Harvey um, and then facing a pandemic? What were some of the major challenges you faced communicating with your partners in the community at large, you and your board? And are there, are there things that you would do differently um, uh, as a way of um, addressing, you know, hurricane seasons right around the corner? Um, it never ends, as you pointed out. Well, no, it's COVID that's seen to never end. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so, so with the with the partners, they, they fall into buckets. Um, very similar, uh, uh, similar to Doug's five Fs. Now that we have foes, but I mean, there's there's organizations that they they'll jump right on things. Um, they, you know, they'll work with you easy. And so, anytime we have a disaster, we saw this with COVID. We saw this with the ice storm, Harvey. You've got the early adopters. Uh, the ones that you can rely on and those those we really push heavily we make agreements with them in advance knowing that we're you know you know it, as soon as the roads are clear or clear enough we're going our philosophy here is a taco bell can be open so can we that is not the perspective quite frankly of most nonprofits you know they're they're a little on the slow side you know, they're the people they serve don't have much pressure over them the donors don't know but there's a bunch um, that they'll really get aggressively. And so we re rely extremely heavily on those organizations, you know, in, in the early days. And then it's just working with the other ones as they come back online. What is it they can do? COVID, of course, created these other challenges. Uh, most of our partners are either 100 percent or very close to relying on volunteers. Mm -hmm. You know, we're like 50 percent normally. Um, but, you know, their volunteers have a tendency to be older than ours on it. Um, and so there were a lot of safety concerns and that just knocked so many out of, out of the water. And so it really be, just becomes you identify, well, who, who is the coalition of the willing? Um, and then work with them as heavily as you possibly can. What do I need to do to support them? And then that's, that's how we respond. It just goes back to, you know, our goal is to be just the most flexible organization we can be. You know, here's our mission. And then so whatever that opportunity is, however, whatever that scale is, we can respond to that. And then having so many different partners and so many being so good um, is how we're able to do it. Anna, this is a, a bit of a return to a question that we talked about earlier. Um, difference between serving on a for-profit and a nonprofit board. What if uh, you're approached by one of your NACD colleagues who's been invited to serve on a nonprofit board? What advice, what cautions, what encouragement might you provide? Um. I think one of the one of the main things that that you've got to keep in mind is if you serve on a nonprofit board, you've got to believe in the mission. That's it's really really important that you that you believe in the mission and understand that it is a mission driven organization. Um, it is not an organization that's that's driven by and funded by investors who can come and who who come and go depending on you know, what your results are. These are people that really believe in what the, what the mission is. And so I think that that's, that's one thing that's real important. The other thing I would, I always recommend and, and tell nonprofit um, potential nonprofit directors is um, nonprofit board work actually can consume much more time than your for-profit board work. And I know that probably sounds strange to people, but it's very true. And that's to Doug's point that most nonprofit organizations are underfunded and um, require time from volunteers, and which is why you need to make sure you really believe in the mission of the organization or you're not going to be willing to spend the time. Um, but, you know, I, I, I came across a, a great quote the other day made by a World War II um, ace, a World War II pilot um, that said, there's nothing stronger than the heart of a volunteer. Um, and it was James Doolittle that, that said those words. And, and I think that is very true. Um, if you are a non, if you're a nonprofit board director, you are a volunteer and um, you need to be willing to, to give that kind of time. Doug, I wanna shift gears just a little bit that um, everyone's talked about the, the pivoting that nonprofits have done and the, the willingness to adapt quickly. Um, can you, 
have you observed any things that uh, nonprofits are doing more frequently as a result of the pandemic to stay in a growth mode or, or things that if, if you were advising them, you would say, do more of this and less of that? You know, I, I think it's totally dependent on what kind of nonprofit board you're on. If you're not really in, involved in basic needs, um, you know, food insecurity, housing insecurity, healthcare insecurity, you know, I've, I have advised the boards that I'm affiliated with or that have asked me, don't go out and try to raise money right now. Uh, it, it, you know, people, you may offend people by people looking at you and say, are you kidding me? We're in the middle of a pandemic and you want to, you know, so I think you have to be careful about that. Um, you know, whether you, I think when you're talking about pivoting, that's kind of a strategic thing which is to me different than a crisis response. A crisis response is how do we really continue what we're doing now in the middle of a pandemic and survive it? Pivoting is, are we doing the right things? I remember search back um, probably, this is a decade ago, you know, they, they had, uh, they, they did case management for the homeless. They had a dental program. They had an eye care program. They provided showers, food, some housing, uh, and early childhood education. And, and they went through a strategic planning process. And, and I think these are great board questions. Not what do we do well? It's what do we do better than anyone else? And what do we do that no one else can provide that's a needed service? And they came to the conclusion that there were two things out of all that stuff. And that was case management for the chronically homeless search. I, I still think I'm not on the board. My wife's on the board, full disclosure, but I think they do that better <laughs> than anyone. And they provide the only high quality child care, uh, uh, early health, childhood education for the children of the homeless. And so over a period of two years, they just stopped doing everything else. Wow, if every nonprofit would go through that process, our money would go farther, uh, philanthropist money would go farther, more people would be served more effectively and we could solve some of these problems sooner. That is the perfect place to bring this uh, conversation to an end. We have lots more questions that we just didn't have time to get to. Um, I want to thank our panel members, Anna, Doug, Brian. Um, you have shared, um, you've been very open and transparent and that's the kind of information that we need to go forward. So I am going to thank you and uh, let remind everyone that this has been recorded because I suspect we all need to go back and watch this a few times just to so much information that you shared with us today. So I am going to hand it off to Nicole McWhorter with Deanie Spiris to um, shut us down today. Nicole? Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. I want to thank each of our presenters today, first for their leadership and second for spending part of their day with us to help make our communities and the nonprofits we work with even better. Anna, Doug, Brian, and Ron Ronnie, thank you so much for your perspectives and expertise that you shared today. Your commitment to organizations beyond those that you directly impact is a gift and one that's much appreciated. Today's program has given us a lot to think about as we help to move organizations from surviving to thriving. The importance of collaboration, bringing the message back to the mission, strategic planning, ensuring social enterprise aligns with the mission and expertise. Um, Anna brought up the importance of understanding what's happening in our community and how the demographics are changing and how we can serve both the community today and in the future. Um, the importance of data. Um, Brian talked through the difference between the operational outcomes that drive our day to day and then the measures that the board uses to track their success. Um, making sure that we have the best measures in place, otherwise the competition becomes um, for nonprofits to be around attention. Um, balancing the mission bottom line with the financial performance bottom line and not to be too precious about the competitive sets that we're using. Um, so really think about who's getting the best talent and that concept around co-opetition and using the best of each other to better serve the community. Um, 
we talked a lot about mergers and the difficulty in discussing them and eventually where needed, potentially merging organizations to ultimately serve the larger collective vision. The five Fs, a powerful analogy around family, friends, fence sitters, foes, and fighters. Um, and thinking about in a merger situation that it's not about you, it's about the mission, because the biggest blocks is Doug brought up are around people issues. So keeping the mission in focus. Um, last but not least, I want to just uh, bring back the great language when you talked about, all of you talked about what the best boards do. Um, they help nonprofits get access to the right resources. Anna shared some really concrete examples of what nonprofit board members and for-profit board members can do. Utilizing a noses in, fingers out, again, another great acronym from Doug, where board members ask insightful questions and follow up with good judgment, but stay out of the day-to-day -day management of the organization. And then last but not least, the best boards find time to think beyond the horizon. Of course, as part of all of this, governance excellence is a critical success factor for nonprofits. As such, I would encourage nonprofit directors to consider an NACD directorship certification, which puts you on the leading edge of governance issues. Chris Kristen mentioned earlier that you received several items as a pre-read and those along with this recording will be distributed after the program for your later reference and use. Please also take a minute to complete the program evaluation contained in the post-program e email. On behalf of Dini Spheris, the National Association of Corporate Directors, Texas Tri-City Chapters, Greater Houston Grant Makers Forum, the Robert and Janice McNair Foundation, the Rice University Center for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Leadership in the United Way of Greater Houston. Thank you so much for attending our program and for the amazing work you help make possible in our communities. This concludes our program. Thank you all and have a wonderful day.